Dustin Franks is with Crypto Solutions. Dustin, you're up. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you, Doug, for the backup of the backup. You did a great job there. I appreciate the intro. <laughs> so, Crypto Solutions, full disclosure, this is not my full-time job at this time. I do this about 20 hours a week. I have what I call my day job uh, at Leggett & Platt. I was talking to a young man out in the audience who started a business, a solar business, and he mentioned it takes a little while for your business to become profitable. I said, you're absolutely right. That's why I work at Leggett as I try to grow this business. Um, I have three children, four car payments, and mortgage payment. I hope eventually we get to a point where perhaps this is my full-time job, but we'll see. A little background, uh, I launched the business the first week of January of this year. Uh, we were incorporated, well, it's an LLC, but it became officially registered in Delaware January the 7th. Two employees, myself, I call myself the founder slash CEO. I have another guy that I've hired as a consultant that is my backup um, for when I'm on vacation or need help with reporting or invoicing, things like that. He's actually been doing crypto longer than I have. He told me years ago to buy it. I didn't listen. I regret that. Um, my background, I worked for Edward Jones as financial advisor, so I had to pass the Series 7, Series 66. I see a familiar face in the crowd that was an Edward Jones advisor as well. I'm glad he came today. Um, I have over two decades of experience doing technical work, mainly in IT departments, um, a variety of different roles, programmer, project manager, I've done business analysis work. So I think the combination of the uh, IT experience and financial services experience is really helping me with this business. What am I trying to solve? What am I trying to provide? Well, there was a lot of discussion in the community and my network of friends about crypto. Some of them didn't know anything about it, but they were interested. Uh, maybe they saw something on Facebook or social media about Bitcoin. Um, and I, I was like, you know what? There are businesses that are actually starting to invest in cryptocurrency. I started paying attention, and I thought, well, what the heck, I'll build a website, I'll launch a business, I'll try to provide a service to people that are interested in crypto. We'll see how it goes. What's the worst thing that could happen? There's no interest. Well, it's turned out that there's been a lot of interest. Um, what are my strategies? Uh, like I mentioned before, education first. The very first part of my website I built was a resources page. And to kind of test it, I went to my parents' house and I'm like, hey mom, hey dad, what do you know about crypto? They're like, we know nothing about it. We're in our early 70s, it's scary. So I showed them the website. I showed them a PowerPoint presentation that I built for some kids in Seneca because I had a client that wanted me to do an educational seminar for their kids. They watched the videos on the website. They watched the PowerPoint presentation. They're like, okay, it kind of makes sense. I'm like, okay, I'll consider that a success. Um, I have a testimonials page as well where clients who have invested with me say, hey, he's doing a good job. Um, I encourage my, my prospects and clients, ask questions. I want you to feel comfortable. It's a very volatile investment. It's not like buying CDs, stocks, ETFs. It's very different. Um, when one person says something, it can move the market. We saw that in May with Musk making some statements about Bitcoin. So. You have to have a stomach for volatility. It's a bit like riding a roller coaster. What services do I provide? I would say the core service is managing cryptocurrency portfolios, much like a financial advisor would do if you wanted to invest in stocks. Um, I would say my typical portfolio is a mix of 10 to 12 cryptocurrencies. Some of those you've probably heard of, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, but we also mix in others. It's all about diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I do technical consulting. I've helped businesses set up uh, Bitcoin payment solutions. The first one I did in Joplin was Nine Lives Cat Lounge over on 7th Street. Uh, Nine Lives Cat Lounge, shameless plug, check it out. I know it sounds kind of strange, but it's pretty cool. You can go get smoothies, coffee, hang out with cats. It's very relaxing. And then I do educational presentations. Uh, marketing, I've tried different things. I've never really been a marketer before, so this was a bit of a new thing for me. 
I've done some targeted Facebook campaigns uh, in Overland Park, Springfield, Northwest Arkansas. I haven't got a lot of leads from that approach yet, but it's not very expensive. I normally spend, you know, 25 to 50 bucks on a targeted campaign. Um, word of mouth, certainly, people hearing about what I do, um, talking to other people about it. Probably my best um, resource for new customers so far have been referrals. Someone comes on board, they are a customer for a couple of months, they see good results, they talk to friends about it. Uh, speaking engagements like this are great. I was really excited to have this opportunity, and I'll be presenting in Springfield at Sertona later this month. And then Google searches. Um, I built my website. I did some search engine optimization stuff. I'm not a wizard at that. Still learning there. I've had a couple of businesses approach me offering their marketing services, but I haven't taken that leap quite yet. And then challenges. This is what I was really excited about when I heard that One Million Cups really wants to hear about challenges. Um, I was watching a video months ago before I launched, and the guy basically said, you can't wait around until you figure out everything before you launch. You need to launch and then figure out the little details, and that's what I did. Um, I went ahead and launched, took a little bit of a risk, and have been kind of figuring out things as I go along. Um, one of the challenges I have is selling an intangible product. A lot of people still like to touch and feel whatever they buy. Uh, one of the earlier presenters here at One Million Cups mentioned the same thing. Um, I think they were doing some HR stuff, and. Um, well, what I tell people that, you know, say I'd rather touch and feel whatever I buy is I'm like, well, in the old days when you bought stock, you got a stock certificate, you could touch it, you could put it in your safe deposit box. It's not quite like that anymore. Uh, finding the right clients is a challenge. Again, the appetite for risk. Uh, May was a bit of a nerve wracking month for some clients because the market went down. And what I hoped was that people didn't panic sell. And, and there was a lot of new money in crypto. Um, but then some things happened like China, saying some things that were not pro-crypto. We saw that in Turkey, we saw that in some other countries as well, India. And then Musk, Musk said some things that made some people nervous. I was very happy that I didn't have any panic sellers. Um, researching and finding solutions for things that people want that I normally can't get my hands on, like SafeMoon, Beta, Hex. I had to figure out how to buy it, which wasn't always easy. I had one very scary situation where I thought I lost $1,000 for a guy, but then I figured out I actually did it right, so that was a bit nerve-wracking. I didn't want to make that phone call to that gentleman who happens to be in the audience. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, take care of your clients. I don't want to grow too fast. I want to grow at a slow pace. I want to make sure that new clients have a good experience just like my existing clients do because I think some companies are really good about bringing new customers on board, but then they kind of neglect their existing clients. I hope I did that in six to eight minutes. Did, was I good? Okay. You're good. Uh, there's my my address for my web page, my phone number, my email address, and my uh, snail mail address, which is my house, because I'm trying to keep my overhead low. So, thank you. Round of applause. Good job. <laughs> so, as you know, the way this works, because we're recording this, we'll go around, and if anybody has any input or insight, or if you've got questions about something you're facing that you need some advice on, yeah. let everybody know that. So, Lo, you have something? Yes. Lo has a first question. And you did a good job, but can you just explain a little bit more about what it is that's out of real advice? You get the whole thing. Sure. So, um, let's say that I have, I don't know, $100,000 I want to invest it. Um, let's use more of a traditional model. I want to buy mutual funds, stocks, ETFs, stuff like that. I might reach out to a financial advisor at Edward Jones, Wells Fargo. Hey, here's some money. I want to invest it. They would figure out what to buy. They would manage that money. They would provide you with monthly reports. Here's how your investments are doing. They would charge you either commissions or a monthly fee to manage your money. This is the same concept for what I call my core business. You say, hey, I'm interested in crypto. Here's $2,000. I invest it. I send you monthly reports that show how your investments are performing. At any point in time, you could say, I want to sell them. I sell them, I give you the money. That's essentially what it is, but I also do technical consulting. Um, I had a lady in Springfield who had a lot of money in crypto, and she didn't really have a good game plan for managing it. Um, so we, I told her, I don't want to share too many details here, but she, if her house would have caught on fire, she would have lost all her crypto because she had usernames and passwords written down in a notebook. That would have been gone, and she would not have been able to log into her accounts and manage her money. And I've heard horror stories of that happening, and, and in fact, 20% of Bitcoin in circulation is lost because people have forgotten their login credentials. 
these are things you have to think of. So that's something I did with her. I spent two hours with her coming up with a game plan. Like you have to think of the worst case scenario. I also do educational seminars. I mentioned that I had a gentleman that wanted me to come do a seminar for his kids, which I thought was awesome. So I built the PowerPoint presentation, drove to his house, and as I was pulling into the driveway, I got a phone call. He's like, you're never gonna believe this. Two of my kids are puking, we're gonna have to cancel. I'm like, no problem, we'll just reschedule. Um, and then I do business consulting as well. So I had a guy reach out, well, okay, I'm gonna tell the truth. I kind of reached out to him and said, hey, I'd really like to set up Bitcoin payments for a business. Would you be interested? He's like, oh yeah, absolutely. So he did that. And the funny thing is he had a guy come in and saw that he accepted Bitcoin payments. He ended up buying that guy's car with Bitcoin. Yeah, so that, that led to a conversation that led to something really cool. And uh, so, but my core business is, is managing portfolios. Question, hold on. <clears throat> Dustin, as you said, this is very volatile. It yes. would go up 20, 30% and down 20, 30% in one day. Are you advising people to do it short term, try to trade it, or is it a long term strategy? Long term. I, I get the question a lot what do you think the runway is for this? And I tell them eight to 10 years. I, I saw a really good post on Twitter that made me think, and it, the essence of it was there's three types of investors. There's investors, speculators, and traders. I look for investors, long-term. Traders, day trade, I don't day trade. I'm like, if you want to day trade, go day trade. Open up a Robinhood account or something. I also don't do speculation. So if someone comes to me and they say, I have $1,000, I want to turn it into a million. I'm like, I can't do that. Like maybe I get lucky and I pick some crypto that's 10 cents and it turns into 100, but I can't guarantee that. So if you're really wanting to speculate, I'm probably not the best fit for you. You might want to try to do that yourself. So a great question, but um, I'm in it for multiple years. What percent of somebody's portfolio would you put 10 to 15 percent. I've had people percent. that said, you know what I want to do? I want to cash out part of my 401k and invest it. I'm like, I wouldn't recommend that. I, I'd recommend being conservative, maybe doing 10 percent. Put your other money in the bank, have an emergency fund, a rating day fund, uh, buy stocks, buy mutual funds. Um, and I like to work with people who are, you know, comfortable financially. Like if my client contract actually says, if you can't afford to lose this investment, we probably shouldn't do business. Do you understand? Sign here, okay. Because I don't want you to lose it and then tell me I can't make my mortgage payment. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Yes. How, how do you determine which type of crypto to advise people to buy? Yeah, so I have a 30 minute meeting with new customers and I try to get a sense of their financial health, so to speak. And then also, what do they like? But most of my clients are gonna have five or six of the same cryptos, and then five or six different ones. The five or six core ones are things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, the big market cap ones. And then if someone tells me, well, I'm really interested in these projects, like, I don't know, Stellar Lumens, then I would add that. It, it's a mix of more expensive cryptos like Bitcoin and then cheaper ones. The cheaper ones are the ones that could really take off and, and make you a lot of money. I have a question on the um, on the business side of this for businesses that accept cryptocurrency. How do you see the processing fees compared to more traditional sources? Or yeah, they're way lower. Way, way lower. Way lower. And do do businesses when that transfer happens? Uh, does that uh, is it like the the customer is paying in Bitcoin, and then does the business then have like a separate account that is then Bitcoin, or is it like uh, converted to USD or something? Great question, yeah. So I presented Nine Lives with two options. I said, we could use something like BitPay or we could set up a digital wallet and then they could just send Bitcoin to your digital wallet. So he chose the digital wallet option. So we set up a digital wallet, wallet in Exodus and then we had a QR code. So someone walks up, they're like, hey, I want to uh, buy a sandwich and a smoothie. They just use the QR code and then they do the transfer that way from their wallet. And then he can decide if he wants to keep Bitcoin or turn it into USD. With something like BitPay, um, you can set it up to automatically convert that Bitcoin to USD as soon as you get it. There is a fee there, it's usually about 1% or less. But if you were comparing it to something like, let's say, taking Visa or MasterCard payments at your business, it's usually less than that. Cool. So being someone that has been 
with Bitcoin being and all these um, stocks being in the market or on the news and everything, trying to learn from not having any knowledge about it, trying to decipher the the articles and try to just figure it out. I think a really good way to market your business is just those informational, you know, two or three minute informational videos that someone like me could watch and be like. Oh, so because I just don't, I like try to read the articles and I don't really understand how I could invest in it or what would be safe. Like I don't trust the marketing, you know, obviously sure. when I clicked on the articles, then I'm getting flooded with all these articles. Um, but it is something that's appealing to, you know, just uh, that fun, you know, like a fund that you would, that you would invest in it, but just not having the knowledge. So I think that a really good way to market it would, would be those educational, um, even short videos that you're pushing out through Facebook or, or that that are just really educational on how you can be part of it. Um, yeah, I appreciate be, that. Would be powerful. Thank you. Hey, Dustin. Uh, I know you're still uh, fairly it's, uh, in the early stages here, but do you have any quick wins or success stories that you could share? Yeah, I had plenty of them until May came. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I had been showing clients profits every month until May. Um, yeah. So I wrote an email to all my clients right before I left for my vacation in Oregon, and I said, if you're looking at the charts today, they're red. Don't panic, okay? We saw this in 2018 when Bitcoin fell over 70%. The people that get rewarded are the people that can stomach the downs, like right, you know, buy the dip, sell when the prices are high. Um, I, I will say one success story could be that I had nobody panic sell. I was really encouraged by that. I told people from the beginning, this is a long-term investment. That's really what I hope you're in it for, and I didn't have anybody sell, which is encouraging. Um, and I think it will bounce right back. I mean, we saw that after 2018. It just took off, right? 2019 was great. 2020 was great. 2021 was good until May. And I think that humans have a tendency to focus on negative sometimes. They hear someone like Musk say something bad about Bitcoin, they panic, they sell. Um, but there's a lot of positive news regarding crypto, all the businesses that are getting involved in it. So I'm very bullish on it. Um, but good question. Where do you see the, the future of crypto going? Well, I, one analogy I like to use a lot is like, think about how, I'll give you two examples. Think about how money has evolved over time. We went from the barter system to cash, to debit credit cards, to PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. We're kind of moving into the cryptocurrency phase of things. Um, I use crypto to buy things. Uh, I've helped businesses set it up. I'm a little stingy with paying with crypto though because I like it so much. I, I think I'm sort of wasting my money if I pay for things in crypto because I, I see growth. But yeah, I'm very bullish on the future of cryptocurrency. Yeah, I had a conference call with uh, the largest entertainment booking company in the country. They wanted to use me as a, a technical consultant for NFT stuff. So this company, uh, they let entertainers, comedians, face painters, all kinds of different people uh, register on the platform. And then me, if I decide I want to have a face painter at my daughter's birthday party, I go on the website and then I get bids. And they're like, you know, we could see uh, our artists creating works in uh, making them NFTs. Like, let's say that an Elvis impersonator uh, does a party and they film a video, they might turn that into an NFT. You can kind of see some stuff with the NBA developing the Topshop product, just taking off and making millions of dollars. You're probably going to see that with uh, Major League Baseball and the NFL soon. So I'm very bullish on NFTs as well. If people don't know what NFTs are, non-fungible tokens, it's basically a way of um, authenticating a piece of digital work. So like, you know, you go into a museum, you see a painting, someone has said this is an original painting, right? Um, it's the same concept, but for digital pieces of work. Um, there was a guy that lives in South Carolina, close to one of my clients, who sold his NFT collection for hundreds of millions of dollars. It was crazy. So yeah, I'm, I think it's gonna be a big deal. So Dustin, one of the things that I've, you know, in reading, continue to read, you know, one of the appeals of the crypto market is that it's deregulated, 
right? Government's yes. not in that. And so because of that, you know, unlike the stock market, there's not, it's, it's I would compare it to more like the wild, wild west. Yes. Okay. And so with that, I see government scrambling to get into the digital currency market mm -hmm. because the destabilization, destabilization of, you know, federal economies as far as that goes, or federal money. How do you see that playing out in the future as governments try to get in the game and try to compete against crypto so that way they can contain or continue to make decisions um, and basically control that central yeah, banking system? I, I think that's one of the reasons you've seen some countries come out with some non-pro-crypto statements like what we've seen in Turkey, China, um, India to a certain extent is it sort of makes the governments nervous since it is deregulated, I think. Within the next two years, you're probably going to see some regulation in the U.S. There will be a government cryptocurrency. I think, like the last issue of The Economist I read, the cover said GovCoin, and they were talking about the cryptocurrency that we will have eventually. I don't really see that, you know, necessarily competing with other cryptocurrencies, but um, I do think there will be regulation, and, and that kind of leads me to the whole tax conversation. Um, cryptocurrency is treated as property, not currency, so. From a tax perspective, you can't not pay your taxes unless you like to go to jail. Um, you sell your crypto one year after you buy it, you're going to pay long-term capital gains. You sell it sooner than that, you're going to pay short-term capital gains. So that's another conversation we have with prospects and clients is you need to pay your taxes. Like, if you tell me I'm not going to pay my taxes on profits, I'm like, I'm probably not a good fit for you. But yeah, I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see regulation. And it doesn't scare me. I don't think it's a bad thing. Okay, I don't see any questions out there, so I've got one for you. All right. And I'm a believer in there's no such thing as a dumb question. Yeah. So we're using the term cryptocurrency, but yet all of the currencies of the world are backed by a central bank of the, of the countries. Mm -hmm. How is cryptocurrency in it any different than a stock that somebody would invest in? Because with regular currency, with CDI, you've got asset-backed currency, and I know with crypto there's a certain number of blockchain, but if I invest in a company and they have a certain number of stock, what's the difference between a stock and a crypto coin? Sure, so let's talk about a couple of different things. Let's talk about Bitcoin and let's talk about gold. So with Bitcoin, there's 21 million Bitcoin, that's all there is, so there's a finite supply. And there's only about two and a half million that haven't been mined yet. So there's a finite supply, which is attractive. If you talk about something else like Dogecoin, there's an infinite supply, which in my opinion is not attractive. That's why I don't buy it. Um, gold, uh, we used to be on the gold standard, but that went away. So your dollar used to be backed by gold, right? But that went away in the 70s when Nixon was president. So I have people that tell me, hey, I heard that Bitcoin is kind of like digital gold. And I'm like, well, yeah, in some respects, but, and then they might say, well, what is it backed by? And I'm like, well, what is, anything backed by, like the dollar's no longer backed by gold. We want it because we can spend it, you know, and in terms of cryptocurrency, uh, it's kind of a supply and demand thing. So in general, if you see prices for crypto going up, that probably means more people are buying it than selling it. Similar in some ways to stock, if a company's performing well, like Amazon releases their Q2 results and they're positive, you might see the stock price go up, people want it. Um, but that's how I would compare it to stock is supply and demand. If people want it, prices generally go up. If there's a lot of people selling it, you're probably going to see the prices go down. Great. Gene, you got a question? Last question. Saving the best for lives. Oh. And she's a librarian, so watch out. I have a question and then I have a book recommendation as well. Okay. So I like to add about one to two clients per week. That's comfortable. You know, doing um, the consultation call, onboarding all of that stuff, one to two people people a week is comfortable. I could do more than that, I could do five, but I'd rather be the turtle than the hare at this point. Um, I'd like to end the year and have maybe 60 to 70 clients. And about where are you, like where are you now? 30. Okay, um, and my book recommendation 
publication, there's a book called Company of One by a gentleman named Paul Jarvis. And have you, have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. Um, he, like, he's really about like keeping your business small scale, and I think he has a lot of great tips and advice in that. I'll, I'll read that, but I won't tell my uh, my other guy that I hired about it, because then he'll be like, well, who's the one? Is it me or you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll check that out. Round of applause. Good job. <laughs>